Hey guys, how are we? Arnaldo here, and I'm one of the pastors here at Anchor Church, and I want to welcome you uh, to Anchor Online. So wherever you're meeting uh, together, or if you are at home alone, whether you're self-isolating, again, we want to welcome you uh, to experiencing uh, fellowship together, even through this medium. Now, if you're new with us, uh, we would love to connect with you. Uh, One of the ways that you can do that is up the top, you'll see a connect with us button. Uh, You can go ahead and click that, enter your details, and we would love to connect with you this week and see how we can love you, support you uh, along your journey wherever you are. So you can do that or uh, you can slide into our DMs on Instagram at Anchor Church. Uh, We would love to hear from you whichever way you feel comfortable reaching out to us. We want to give a special shout out to all the parents out there. We know that this time has been uh, at times frustrating or difficult, and we want to make sure that you are equipped to disciple your children. And so if you want to go to anchorchurch.com.au forward slash uh, online, you'll find resources there uh, to disciple your kids through the gospel during this time. Additionally, on that link, you're going to find uh, ways that you can reach out to us if you need prayer particularly. Or we have our staff team and our pastors here on the side where you can request prayer as well. Uh, But also, on that link, you'll find uh, ways where you can request some other kinds of help. We understand that COVID-19 has affected all of us, some more in other ways than others. And we would love to be the hands and feet of Jesus during this time for you. Now, there's a few things happening uh, for us as a family. One is we have a course called Growth Track. So if you are someone who has maybe even joined a GC or a church at home group, uh, or maybe this is your first time and you're wondering who are we? Uh, What makes us tick? Uh, What is our history? Where are we going? What is our future? Uh, Growth Track is for you. Uh, This time we're going to have a mix of online and in person depending on what restrictions look like in the next several weeks. But we do plan to meet on Wednesday the 29th of July for the first week. So we would love for you to reach out and let us know if uh, you're someone who wants to learn about who we are and become a partner at Anchor. Now, maybe you're not there yet. Uh, Maybe you haven't uh, committed yourself to Jesus yet. Maybe you have so many questions. Maybe you have friends who have so many questions. Uh, That's why we're putting on Alpha as well, coming up on the 28th of July. Now, Alpha will be all online uh, as far as we know. uh, And we would love for you to invite folks. So whoever it is uh, who may have the deep some real deep questions about life and God and meaning and purpose, this is for them. This is going to be a non-judgmental space where we get to ask big questions and discuss together. So I want to throw right now to a video that gives you a bit of a taste for what Alpha is all about. If you've ever wondered if there's more, You're not alone in that. We all explore, every day, in small ways and big. We find ourselves, reinvent ourselves, define ourselves, publish our lives. We find ways to stand out and ways to blend in. We meet people that remind us of us and people that remind us of who we want to be and people that just make the journey that much more fun. We connect and share. We learn from each other and grow together. We celebrate and mourn side by side. We push our limits, challenge ourselves, fall down and get back up again. Our days are long and our nights get short. We put in the hours in the hope of building something that lasts. And at the end of the day, find joy in the fleeting things. We want to squeeze all the life out of life and hit pause on moments we wish could last. Put simply, we want to live, and along the way discover all we can, experience more, and find out who we really are. For all our searching, it's rare to find time to think and talk about the big questions of life, about faith and reason and God and meaning. But exploring is good. We're built for it.
So we would love for you to think about who you can invite to our next Alpha course online beginning the 28th of July. Now around questions of faith and life and God and scripture, we are we began last week uh, with our new series called Deconstructing God, where Alex Stark, he is uh, one of the speakers for Ravi Zacharias International uh, Ministries. He spoke on the issue of doubt. What does it mean to be human and to doubt? And if you missed that, we would love for you to go to our YouTube channel and check that out. And today, uh, Kit Barker is going to be taking up the mantle and uh, preaching on uh, Old Testament violence. The, the question is, would Jesus kill the Canaanites? And so last week we talked about doubt. This week we're, we're wrestling through Old Testament violence. Now, a little bit about Kit is he is one of the lecturers at SNBC. He's an Old Testament lecturer at SNBC, one of my dearest friends. And I promise you will be blessed today as we lean into God's word and find out who, who is God. What, what, is, what are these stories all about in the Old Testament about uh, violence and struggle there? And we would... Uh, love for you to continue this conversation with us. Please hit us up on the side, send us a DM, send us an email. We would love for us to wrestle through these topics together. Now I want to read uh, some scripture here for us uh, before Kit comes on. I'm going to be reading from uh, the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to read from verse 11. It says this, Then, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, those are crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Now, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of their riders and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast And the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who was in the presence, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, welcome to Online Church today. My name is Kit Barker, and it's a real privilege to be with you as we continue in the Deconstructing God series. Today, I've been asked to talk about the violence in the Old Testament. And it's a topic that I speak on quite regularly. It's a topic that I find troubles many of us. And it's a topic that's incredibly important important to our understanding of the gospel uh, and to our, our faith and how we wrestle with how what we see in Scripture matches the world that we live in. I turned, well, I turned a certain age a couple of years ago. And when I did, I was on my way home for, on the way home from work, I stopped in and got a haircut at a friend's uh, barber shop in North Sydney. And on a whim, I decided to shave my beard. Now, I hadn't shaved my beard in over a decade. My young children hadn't seen me clean shaven. My oldest one may have, but he was very small. And so I was turning up to my birthday dinner without warning them that I'd shaved my beard. Now, here's a photo of what I looked like before and after. This is the same uh, shot at work 
the day after I shaved my beard. As you can see, uh, I didn't recognize myself and my kids had a hard time recognizing me. I turned up to this small Italian restaurant early and I was there by myself. I saw them come to the door. I stood up at the table and as they walked in, they looked right past me. I don't know if they thought I was a waiter or just a stranger there to greet them, but they didn't even look at me until my wife walked in and then she started giggling and my kids started crying. And then I realized that perhaps I should have warned them. The whole night, my eldest son was drawing uh, sad faces on the paper uh, table, the, the tablecloth. And for the next week, my wife had a hard time hugging and kissing me because she felt strange with this stranger. I wonder, I wonder if that's how we sometimes think about the God in the Old Testament. We're used to one picture of who God is, a comfortable picture, a warm picture, a picture we're uh, used to embracing. But when we go to the Old Testament, we see someone who looks different, who looks like a stranger, who doesn't look like someone we would want to trust or necessarily want to worship, someone we don't understand, someone we don't know. I think that's a pretty common experience. And that's because when we, when we go to the Old Testament, we see all kinds of uh, detailed stories of traumatic and horrific acts of violence. Some are on the hands of people involved in those stories, but some are at the request of God. And I'd like to read just one well-known uh, couple of verses when Saul is asked by God to destroy a town of Amalekites. This, is, this uh, scene comes from 1 Samuel, and it's chapter 15. And Samuel says to Saul, verse 1, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. This wasn't an isolated incident. The people had been in the land for a few hundred years now. The Israelites had come out of Egypt and been in the land. And in all of that time, they were supposed to have done this already. God had commanded them back in Deuteronomy to wipe out the people, the Canaanites living in the land to wipe them out as they moved in, to destroy them totally. In fact, in this story, uh, Saul is reprimanded because he doesn't wipe them out totally. He keeps the king alive and he keeps some of the livestock for himself. And God wanted all of them destroyed, every living thing. The phrase is often, everything that breathes must be put to death. And we see a scene like this in the Old Testament and we think, is this the Jesus that I know? Would Jesus have asked Saul to kill the Amalekites down to every living thing that breathes, children, women, cattle, sheep, donkeys and camels? Would Jesus have asked the Israelites to drive out the nations before them, killing whole towns? Well, these portraits in the Old Testament are disturbing. And they're pervasive. They're pervasive in that you go from book to book and you see the violence in the Old Testament almost at every turn, whether it's the flood in Genesis where God destroys and recreates the whole world, whether it's the taking of the promised land and the destruction of the Canaanites here in Samuel, whether it's the exile where God allows his own people to be overrun by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, so much so that they have to starve inside Jerusalem and they begin eating their children. The kinds of horror of siege warfare that is inflicted upon them. Some see these scenes throughout the Old Testament and they find it simpler and easier just to reject this picture of God as something we can believe in, something we can see in the life and person of Jesus. It just can't be the same person. 
the Old Testament, as you might be aware, has then proven to be fertile ground for those who want to attack the Christian faith. They point to the Old Testament and uh, can't believe that Christians would believe in this kind of God. Richard Dawkins is a, a classic example of this, and I'll read a quote for you. It'll appear here on the screen. He says this about the Old Testament and about particularly about the Canaanites being driven from the land. He, he states, The ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua, a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so. And the Bible story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho and the invasion of the promised land in general is morally indistinguishable but from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. The Bible may be an arresting and poetic work of fiction, but it is not the sort of book you should give your children to form their morals. I think many people see the Old Testament this way, something to be avoided. In fact, I was giving a similar talk a couple of years ago and uh, the leaders at the church had put uh, an advertisement out saying that I was coming and giving the topic uh, of the week. And they reported back to me that there might be a really small turnout. When people heard that I was going to speak about the violence in the Bible, they told the minister that they just weren't going to come. Now, thankfully, that morning, there were a few more than anticipated, and even a couple of the people turned up and, and admitted to me that they weren't going to come that day, but were glad that they were able to spend the time wrestling with it. I wonder where you're at with this portrait of who God is, your engagement with the God of the Old Testament. Is it easy just to, uh, easier just to neglect or remove this part of Scripture from our faith? The great Christian theologian C.S. Lewis uh, said something similar about the Psalms when he wrestled with those parts of the Psalms where the psalmist seems angry and cries out to God to judge his enemies. He says something like, the bad parts just won't come away clean. As you may have noticed, they are intertwined with the most exquisite things. In this case, Lewis is referring to all of the beauty of the Psalms where he pours, they pour out their faith to God. How are they intertwined with these cries for justice and cries for vengeance? But similarly, throughout the Old Testament, the beauty of God's deliverance, the beauty of God's gracious redemption of a people out of Egypt, for example, is combined with his fury and his wrath and his judgment and destruction. So one possible solution, I guess, is to remove parts of the Old Testament that we're not comfortable with. But as Lewis remarks, those bad parts just don't come away clean. We end up remaking the Old Testament and remaking God in the way we want him to be, rather than engaging the text that he's given us, engaging God in his own self-revelation in the scriptures. The solution is not to remove parts of the Bible. The solution isn't to make the problem smaller, remove those parts we don't like. The way to a solution is actually to recognize that the problem is much bigger. It's much bigger than a few verses in Samuel. It's much bigger than the destruction of Canaanites. It's much bigger than the flood or even the exile of God's people. I want us to take us to uh, just a couple of New Testament portraits of Jesus where we'll see the violence of the Old Testament is reflected in, the, in Jesus and his life and ministry in the New Testament. The first is from John 2. In John chapter 2, a famous scene where Jesus walks into the temple and sees people taking advantage of those in the community, exploiting them for their own financial gain. And he goes away and crafts whips in order to drive the money changers out of the temple. In other parts of the Gospels, he warns towns against their unbelief. He warns individuals against the judgment that will come against them. And perhaps the most chilling scene is his return in the book of Revelation. Let me read a few verses 
where we see Jesus come as God's king in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, of mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave small and great. A picture of the return of Jesus with the armies of heaven come to extend his reign and rule and kingdom to all creation and to destroy all those who have been opposed to him. There's much more that could be said about the portraits of Jesus in the New Testament. But my point here is a simple one. We don't have a different picture of God, a different God in the Old Testament and a different God in the New Testament. What we have is more of God. In the Old Testament, we see God as gracious and patient with the people who constantly turn away from him, whom he constantly cries out to and who, who he continues to save. A gracious and merciful God, a holy God that can't be approached by sinful people unless they make themselves clean. And in the New Testament, we see God's mercy, love, grace, all those qualities. We also see his holiness. And his holiness means just judgment, wrath, violence. We don't have a different God. We just have more of the same God. It strikes me as strange that people have this, have this understanding that the Old Testament picture of God is vastly different from the New. P- perhaps I've wondered it's because the details are given to us in the Old Testament. We, we see uh, descriptions of families and people who are coming under judgment. Uh, it's a bit more grotesque and graphic. But when we get to the New Testament... We're not talking about individuals and families or even nations. We're talking about all people, slave and free, small and great. The scale of God's just judgment that comes from his holiness is terrifying. It's hard to comprehend. My argument really is that the Old Testament is not more violent than the new, it's the other way around. Just as we see more of God's love and compassion in the New Testament, we see more of God's holiness and more of God's just judgment in his wrath. That really hasn't solved the problem for us, I know. But it gives us two two choices. We can either reject parts of Scripture and remake God in our own image, remake God the way we want him to, or we can accept God's word, accept the picture of himself that he's given us and embrace the character of God as loving and compassionate, but also as holy and just in his judgment. There's, um, there's a strange Uh, I think, irony to the idea that we can uh, just remake and reshape God into a picture that we're more comfortable with. I don't think it becomes as comforting as we 
believe it to, as we believe it will. Uh, many years ago now, I was um, traveling in North America while I was living there, and I had the opportunity to go to Alaska for a month. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Alaska for a month, highly recommended. Uh, it is fantastic. But one of the um, one of the scenes and one of the episodes uh, that I, that we went through there was um, well, there were many times I was scared for my life. Let's put it that way. Uh, bears, um, strange people who picked us up on the side of the road. But this time was far more controlled. We were simply going on a tour of the Denali National Park. We were driving out a few hours. They drop you off in the middle of nowhere. You get to walk around and, and see grizzly bears from hopefully a distance, which we did. And then you drive back. And I think it's a two or three hour trip, but it felt like a whole day. This is a national park, a mountainous national park. And there's one road in and one road out. And really, it's not much of a road. It's only one lane. It's a one lane dirt track carved into the side of a mountain, which is fine most of the time until you find the other tour bus coming back the other way. At which point, the bus closest to the hill pulls up against the rocks, basically jams itself in against the edge, and the other bus creeps around, almost scraping the bus that's stationary. Now, on the way out, you're hugging the cliff, so you think it's not too bad. You just slowed down and waited for the other bus to pass. But on the way back, on the way back, I had a window seat overlooking the valley, hundreds and hundreds of feet below. And there was one point on the bend of the mountain where the bus, the other bus had stopped and we're pulling up alongside it, just going so, so slow. And as I put my face up against the window, thinking if I lean any further, I'm going to tip the bus, I can't see the road. I'm looking down, I get my eye against the window, thinking there is no road beneath these tires. And I'm thinking to myself, it's okay. This is what, the, this is what they do. This is what the drivers do. They do this all the time. They're professionals. They know how to get us home. They, they know how to uh, make sure that all these passengers aren't going to just tumble into the valley. I've never heard of it happening before. Surely it can't happen today. And then the other part of my mind's thinking, well, perhaps this is his summer job. It's only open three months a year. How, how experienced could he be? Maybe he's only just got his license and he's 19 years old. And this is his second run of the week. I don't know. Who is this guy? I've never met him before and your mind runs away. At that moment, you want to believe in someone who is powerful, competent, experienced, and can get you home safely. Recreating, remaking God into a loving God who is neither holy nor just in his judgment, is not someone that I want to put my hope in. I want a God who's going to make things right. I want a God who's going to stand up for the poor and the oppressed, for the marginalized, for those who have been tragically and horrifically harmed in this life. I want someone who's going to bring justice, who's going to renew creation, change the world, bring about the good that he's hoped and designed this world for. I don't want a God who's loving but can't do anything about the problems of this world and this creation. Perhaps even more ironic is that if we remove the violence from the Old Testament, remove the violence from the New Testament, remove God's great capacity for wrath and just judgment, we actually remove the one thing we think we're trying to hold on to, a God of love. I'll say that one more time. If we remove God's holiness and his capacity for great wrath, then we really remove God's love. Or at least we have no idea how much God loves us. Because it's only in God's wrath and in God's holiness and in his just judgment that his love for us is so deeply and profoundly revealed. 
I said before that the, the New Testament is more violent than the old on a scale we can't comprehend. And when we think about chapter 19 in Revelation and 20 and other places of judgment, it's hard to disagree with that. But I think there's an even more violent moment in the New Testament recorded in one place, in a number of places, but in Matthew 27, we see Jesus himself hanging on the cross, having been whipped and tortured and physically beaten and nailed down to the tree. He cries out to his father, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, all the wrath of God all his just judgment on humanity, all of it for all time, is poured out in fury on the one man who didn't deserve it, on the one man who takes it for you and for me, on the one man who willingly goes to suffer this wrath for us. We remove God's great capacity for wrath. We remove his holiness and his just judgment from who he is, and we don't really know how much God loves us, why Jesus died for us, what God has sacrificed in order to make new, you new, to make you one of his children, to make this world again and to recreate it into a good and beautiful place where wrath and just judgment won't be necessary. So we either reject the biblical account, remake God in our own image or in an image that we're comfortable with, or we accept God's self-revelation, accept God's word and embrace this God that we put our faith in. And in doing that, we have someone we can trust to bring us home. And we have someone that we know loves us more than we can ever, ever imagine. Pray with me. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you for the word preached, Lord. We thank you for uh, Kit and the way he, that he has helped us to wrestle through uh, maybe what could be one of the hardest things for us to deal with. And we pray now, Lord, that you would um, come to us now, that, that those who are far may come near, uh, that those who are near, Lord, would be uh, put ablaze on fire by your glory and ultimately your goodness. So may our whole lives, Lord, be uh, shaped so that we would do whatever it takes to bring the wayward home. Help us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, undoubtedly, we are living in some, for us anyway, uh, some unusual times. And so generally what we do when we are in person, we have this uh, really beautiful moment where we get to send everyone out in the power of the Spirit. Uh, and so I want to bless you now as you go out and remind you uh, that regardless of whether we are meeting in person or at church at home or you are uh, by yourself or with some, some friends or maybe this is just your first time with us, right? Uh, we want to bless you uh, with the reality of who God says we are. And so let me bless you here with this. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, may keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. Blessings.